Hi, everyone. Welcome to Waste 360's Nothing Wasted podcast. On every episode, we invite the most interesting people in waste, recycling, and organics to sit down with us and chat candidly about their thoughts, their work, this unique industry, and so much more. So thanks for listening and enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoy this episode. We're bringing you another amazing session from Waste Expo Together Online. This one is called Feed on the Street Atlanta, and it's about the Recycling Partnerships case study on citywide contamination reduction. And you're in for a real treat. Um, you, you're going to hear from Keep Atlanta Beautiful, the Coca-Cola uh, Sustainability Packaging Program Director, the Recycling Partnership, and you're going to dig deep into data and multicultural uh, programs and just a lot of great insights. And you'll walk away with the inspiration and data you need to possibly make changes or improvements in your own city or business. Enjoy this podcast and have a great day. Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Cecilia Shutters. I'm the Community Programs Manager at the Recycling Partnership and the Project Lead for TRP's Atlanta Project, and I will be your moderator today. Our session will be organized into four sections. First, a brief background and overview of the Atlanta Feed on the Street program, and then a three-part Q&A session covering the, pro the program mechanics, Coca-Cola's commitment to the program, and lastly, some discussion um, on the impact of COVID-19 on the program. So let's get started. I'd like to introduce you to um, our speakers today. Uh, Kanika Greenlee, Environmental Programs Director with the Department of Public Works for the City of Atlanta. Moses Tejuso, Community Affairs Manager with the Department of Public Works for the City of Atlanta. And Nicole Smith, Sustainable Packaging Director for Coca-Cola North America. You may read their individual bios on this session's page as well. So now we're gonna get started with the uh, brief background on the, on the project. For those who are unfamiliar with the Recycling Partnership, we are a nonprofit organization focused on improving recycling outcomes across the country. We do this by putting private dollars to work in communities because we know that when we invest in a system to protect resources, empower action, and unlock opportunity, everyone wins. We drive measurable improvement to the recycling system by providing grants, technical assistance, and research and measurement through partnerships like the one we're discussing today in Atlanta. This particular program in Atlanta was made possible through a grant made to TRP from the Coca-Cola Foundation. And now I'll hand the mic to Nicole Smith to describe Coca-Cola's work in this space and interest in this project specifically and then to Kanika and Moses to give an overview of the project and how it fits into the landscape of their work in the city. And then from there, we'll move to the Q&A portion. Nicole? Thanks, Cecilia. We did want to share a little bit more around why Coca-Cola is invested in recycling with communities. And I would say it's all grounded in our world without waste goal. If you've not heard of this, it's based on a couple key factors. One, that we want to design all packaging to be easily recyclable and that we need to include recycled content in those packages so that we can be a demand champion for that material and help pull it through that recycling system. But we also recognize we have to help collect this material because our goal is to collect every bottle and can that we put into the marketplace by 2030. So that's a pretty big goal when we think of how many communities are challenged with their recycling today. So when we think about the opportunity to partner with the Recycling Partnership and a key city like City of Atlanta, this aligns perfectly for us to be able to help share that message to all citizens that there's an importance in recycling and pulling it through the supply chain because these are what make um, the goods that we enjoy every single day. And of course, the partner here is critical for us to build the circular economy. We have to have all the players at the table so that we can help build that system in a sustainable way. So what does this look like? How do we do this on a, a normal basis? 
Well, internally, we work with our design packaging R&D teams. Um, we work with our suppliers of recycled content to help ensure that we're building those in markets of recycled aluminum, recycled glass, and recycled PET so that we can make sure that every single package can have more than one life. And then we start to focus in on how do we help support those communities that need um, assistance in maybe getting carts out to their citizens or perhaps a better education program like we'll hear about more today. So our foundation has been an amazing partner where they've been able to help the recycling partnership with so many of these different communities. Um, so we're giving back dollars to help ensure that communities have access to recycling and of course to learn how to recycle right. And then we're even working with our industry partners and competitors because nobody can go this road alone. This recycling challenge that we face today throughout the U.S. is <laughs> really overwhelming, honestly, if we think about it. And so we've got to work together to help build the broader circular economy, make sure that each and every one of these packages can come back um, in an easy way. Curbside is great. And then be able to work with the community so that it's truly a sustainable model and there's value at the end of the day for them to be a part of that process. Um, and so we're excited to be a part of this. And we're really looking forward to the discussion today with TRP, or the Recycling Partnership, and the City of Atlanta. So, hello, um, Cecilia introduced me, but I'll introduce myself again. I'm Kanika Greenlee, and I work um, with the City of Atlanta in the Department of Public Works and serve as the Environmental Programs Director, along with the Executive Director of Keep Atlanta Beautiful Commission. We're excited to share um, some of the results and the details about our program today. So we have a three-year commitment to improve recycling in the city of Atlanta. It started last year and it'll go through 2021. Uh, we'll be working in three focus areas, uh, single family, and that is primarily what we'll be discuss discussing today. Um, we are working on decreasing contamination and increasing participation. We also will do um, some multifamily work. Um, we'll do a pilot and a toolkit. Um, for multifamily homes in the city of Atlanta. Currently, uh, the city uh, uses city crews to collect single family homes, um, and we do multifamily of six units or less. Otherwise, they are done by private industry. We'll also do um, some work with uh, universities and colleges in the city of Atlanta to do a pilot and toolkit to scale as well. So back in 2017, we did a pilot with uh, 5,000 households on um, four different routes over the course of seven weeks. And we had some uh, dramatic results. I mean, we had some really great results. Our number one uh, contaminant was plastic bags. We saw a huge decrease in that. Um, we saw a huge decrease in our overall contamination and a large increase in our captured recyclable materials. So we wanted to scale this citywide. Um, we service um, approximately 98,000 households and we wanted to do it citywide. But as a lot of you that work in local government know that sometimes uh, your budget, especially for education and outreach, is challenged, um, limited or non-existent. So um, in order to do this to scale, it required a public-private partnership. And that's where uh, Coca-Cola came in. We're really excited to partner with them and have them here in our hometown. Um, and so they were doing their World Without Waste project, as Nicole mentioned, and the partnership um, was a beautiful marriage so we can improve recycling in the city of Atlanta. So um, we'll talk a little bit about our curbside uh, program um, in 2019. As I mentioned earlier, um, our goal was to reach all 98,000 single family homes in the city of Atlanta. Uh, we did that over the course of five months. We started in September of 2019 and we concluded in January of this year of 2020. Uh, we, our goal was to increase our capture rate of uh, good recyclable materials by 20% and decrease our contamination by 25%. Um, our approach to this, um, we div divided it up in um, yearly goals. So year one, we were gonna focus on contamination, really driving down um, the contamination that we saw in the city of Atlanta. We've had some high contamination um, issues. Um, it's been over 30% at one point. Um, we really wanted to work um, with uh, the Feet on the Street team, um, our partners at Coca-Cola and our MRF to drive those numbers down. Um, in year two and three, we'll focus on participation. 
um, and making sure that um, all of our residents, you know, are using their curbside recycling bin and know how to use it right and know that they're recycling right. So um, some of the measurement tools that we use uh, for this project is we did a before and after capture rate study to capture um, what was going in the recycling uh, cart that should and what shouldn't be there. Um, and then uh, TRP uh, had an app developed for us to track contamination, uh, which we're really grateful for. Um, it makes it super easy. If you see the oops tag on the slide that's featured there, um, it really mimics that um, when this team is going out and they'll mark, um, they'll tip the lid of the cart, they'll mark uh, what goes in and what goes, um, what shouldn't be in there. We uh, identify six top contaminants and they'll mark that. Um, and then uh, the MRF, um, our MRF partner also scored and tracked against the TRP app. So we have some checks and balances there. So for phase one, um, our campaign was know what to throw. And again, this focus on uh, decreasing contamination. So these are some of the results that we had um, from our 2019 um, fall tagging campaign, know what to throw. So we uh, reduced um, our uh, contaminants by 19%. Um, so we had um, some good results there. And then we also increased our capture rate of valuable recyclable materials by 9%. Now you can see we haven't quite met those goals, um, but that's why we set them. So we have something to achieve and work towards. Um, we have a little bit of work to do to get to our goals of reducing contamination, but we are well on our way. And I'm going to turn it over to Moses. Hello, my name is Moses Tajuso. I'm the Community Affairs Manager for the Department of Public Works. I manage all things related to litter, recycling, and beautifying communities. For this program, I was responsible for uh, managing operations, resident engagement, as well as internal and external partner collaboration. Uh, during the single family communications phase, we were fortunate to have technical assistance from the recycling partnership. Uh, we had access to an excellent team that would uh, collaborate with our internal DPW co communications team, as well as the mayor's office of communication. Uh, with that, we developed a very robust communications plan around know what to throw. Many of the elements were implemented based on uh, best practices from the 2017 pilot. However, since this was a citywide launch, more elements were added to increase our reach. We started with social media, music streaming, Google ads, along with a press release announcing the fall launch. From there, we transitioned to a local radio station spot that featured an executive from Coca-Cola and other community stakeholders. That campaign ran through the first 30 days of Feet on the Street. Um, also included was outdoor print advertising on bus shelters in targeted areas. Um, this was a proven method used during the 2017 pilot, uh, recognizing the need for traditional print advertising to reach our demographics. Um, residents were driven to our internal city webpage atlantaga.gov slash recycling, as well as our customer service center, um, ATL 311. There, residents could view all the collateral that accompanied the Feed on the Street campaign. Uh, this collateral included a recycling info card, example of the card tag, frequently asked questions, as well as a letter from the DPW commissioner outlining the program. Residents could also use the waste wizard function to know what to throw. Uh, we saw a significant increase in traffic um, to the web page, experiencing over 100% year-to-date growth in page views and more than 200% year-to-date growth during the communications campaign. Uh, this resulted in a whopping 8 million impressions across all marketing mediums, and we hope to keep this momentum and expand upon the success moving into the next phase. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about our phase two approach, which I mentioned earlier. We divided it up into uh, three phases. Um, so next we're going to focus on participation and that campaign is going to be called Better Together. And so we'll use the data that we had from phase one 
um, based on our education and outreach that we um, knew then. So we'll um, also continue our Feet on the Street program, but this focus again, um, we're gonna focus on areas that had low participation and really driving those numbers up. So one of the exciting things um, about the 2019 fall campaign, Know What to Throw, we kind of know what the behavior is now of our uh, residents in the city of Atlanta and what type of recycler there are. So that's really gonna drive how we move forward in this phase two participation campaign. So uh, here are some more uh, campaign collateral materials that you'll receive um, if you're a resident in the city of Atlanta to um, really target um, how we speak to you and based on your behavior profile from the fall campaign, whether you um, never received a oops tag or you never participated in the campaign will really direct our marketing materials to how you recycle. So now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Cecilia uh, for the Q&A portion of the session. Great, thank you all. That was a great presentation um, and great overview of the incredible work uh, being done in the city of Atlanta to improve contamination um, and and what's, what's to come to improve um, or encourage participation next. So um, from here, we're gonna move into uh, the Q&A session. Um, and again, we're gonna focus first on sort of the understanding the mechanics of the program. And then uh, we'll talk to uh, Coca-Cola's participation and interest in the program. And lastly, uh, discuss uh, COVID, the, the impact of COVID-19 on uh, the program itself. So just to set the stage before we dive into those mechanics, um, I'd like to discuss the this idea of the public, the, the role of public partnerships. Um, and, you know, what we've got here is sort of a trifecta of nonprofit, um, private industry, and city government working together um, on a common goal. And so I ask Kanika first, what does the general relationship look like and why is this important for cities? Uh, so the general relationship, I mean, is access to resources and um, data um, and funds and resources that we may not normally have access to. Uh, you know, local governments are a lot of times a strat for cash and particularly when it comes to education and outreach dollars. So if we didn't have this public-private partnership with Coca-Cola and the recycling partnership, we may not have been able to roll this campaign out citywide. And I think that's so key and critical for us. Um, if we really want to focus on improving recycling, I think we can't always just rely on the local government to do it. We have to find other partners that are willing to um, roll up their sleeves and help us get it done. Mm -hmm. And Nicole, why why is Coca-Cola Foundation interested in this as an approach to problem solving? Yeah, I mean, I, I would build on what Kanika shared. You know, as part of our broader World Without Waste goals, we're trying to help get access, get participation, and help guide people to recycle right. And it's really challenging to do that. And so we recognize the need for stakeholders like ourselves to be a part of that conversation, but then to measure the benefits of what's you know progressing and changing within a community's recycling rates by getting better data, we can actually see how well we're doing, right? What actually moves the needle? And I think you know, from those initial studies that you guys also conducted here in Atlanta, we saw great improvements just from those touch points, right? Making recycling, you know, individualized, right, to those individual households. And I think the more that we can support that on a broader community basis, that's when you start to see real change. And so our foundation sees this as critical, our organization sees this as critical, um, and it's just great to have partners like City of Atlanta who want to drive these changes. Yeah, that's great. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so we're going to transition into some of uh, just to kind of get into the mechanics of how this program actually works. Um, I love that this project really is driving and talking about improving supply chain. Uh, a lot of cities provide some type of oops tag or at least have that option in their collection policies. But a unique aspect of this project um, through the grant support uh, has been the, um, the utilization of a management company not only to do the tagging, but to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the tagging team. And so, Kanika and Moses, can you just walk us through what the mechanics of that are um, and how uh, how the team 
integrated into your operations and how, you know, how that worked? Yeah, so I'll start. We um, partner with a company called LeadPoint. And so they have a, a team lead or a manager that manages the feet on the street team. And then we have um, a crew um, that goes out. And so when we did it, for the pilot in 2017, um, it was uh, challenging uh, to say the least. It required me or someone else from the city staff to get up at 5 a.m. and go out, meet the team, make sure that they had all the tools and accesses they need. They needed, and then I was still required to work a full eight-hour day most days, and so um, which ended up being a 12-hour day most days. So. Um, to have um, someone like Lead Point that can come in and manage those day-to-day -day operations um, and do that. I'll let Moses talk a little bit about some of the SOP and the tools we help um, them, how they help, how we help them integrate into the city. Uh, the one I'll mention is just making sure that APD knew that they were out there in case a resident called and said, somebody's looking in my bin, what are they doing? I don't know why they're here. Um, but I think we learned a lot from each other along the way, but Moses, do you have anything you want to add or fill in? Yeah, definitely. I'll echo what you mentioned. It was almost impossible for um, our internal team to manage that process. So it was great um, to bring in Lead Point, a staffing agency familiar with the solid waste industry. Um, from the onset of the campaign, we conducted training with the tagging team so that they would be equipped um, to engage with residents. I think CC from TRP has some pretty cool uh, role playing um, exercises for them. So never a dull moment, um, but that was the intent of that was to make sure that they would feel comfortable with engaging with residents. I think, you know, Lee pointed a great job and it was a great decision to uh, contract with someone um, to handle that duty for us. And I think another key thing was is that we really developed some really great relationships with the street team, the feet on the street team. And so when they were out there day to day interacting with residents and they saw that, hey, I think we need this because it would be helpful. We need magnets or we need lights on the top of our cars um, so we can better identify ourselves. Uh, we were able to pretty much real time, get that back to them and have that updated. And if we weren't able to provide them something that they asked for, we were able to, you know, say, hey, we thought about it and why. And also given that real time feedback of making sure how integral they were a part of this process, because sometimes you're just going out there and you're just thinking I'm just doing something. But no, we're looking at these numbers and um, on a day-to-day -day basis, a weekly basis, a monthly basis, and what type of impact they're having on it. And that information is then shared with the Commissioner of Public Works, the Mayor's Office, Coca-Cola. So they were, I think, they. I don't think they initially uh, got the gravity of how important they were, but I think over time they really realized that. Yeah, I think that that's, that's right. That was one of the key elements from my perspective is just seeing, you know, that back and forth between the field team, the operations team, and the communication between, you know, everybody involved and really making sure that everybody knew, you know, here's why. It's not just the how, but why we're doing this. And I feel like the team really connected. It was a team of eight um, tagging uh, crew on the tagging crew, and they really connected, you know, and they showed up. I mean, we had, I'll just say from, from TRP's perspective, this is one of the most successful teams uh, we've had in the field in that um, we had a very low uh, turnover rate. Uh, we had the same pretty much from the beginning. Uh, we had the same eight individuals who were on the team through this of tagging. And I mean, that's not a that's not a small order. They're up at 5 a.m. five days a week doing this work and they stay committed throughout that six months. And I think that's a real testament to that communication that Kanika just mentioned and to the, you know, the operations that, that Moses talked through. Um, and, and I, I also, in speaking to lead point, you know, the making sure that the compensation level was at where um, it really was valuable for their time. I think that was another big takeaway from just the, the mechanics of it. So, um, I'm wondering if you all can can also talk about um, sort of the benefit to consistent tagging, meaning, um, you know, talk about first 
how you got, like, what was the pattern to get through all 98,000 households? How did you split up? How did we decide to split up um, the routes? How many households were tagged per, you know, time period? And, and what's the value of a consistent tagging approach versus an ad hoc approach? Moses, do you want to take Sure. That? So 98,000 residents, um, five-month period. So that was five waves. And the goal was to engage with a, a resident um, four times um, consecutively. So over the course of four weeks, um, I think the what we saw was that, you know, you may not fix it the first time, but, you know, the more that you saw somebody was watching or, you know, the more that you saw somebody was trying to engage with you at the, at the, uh, the curbside feedback, what we call it, um, the more willing you were to change your behavior. So that four consecutive uh, visits to that resident's cart um, proved to be beneficial. You know, uh, by the fourth time, we would see um, a change in their behavior. Um, it was interesting. Some residents would not put their cart out after that first time of being tagged, um, I guess out of fear <laughs> of being tagged. Um, but once that fear subsided and once they realized that we weren't there to slap them on the hand or anything. It was more so, uh, you know, we're in this together, which is ironically the uh, next phase tagline. Um, people consistently change their behavior over the course of those four weeks. Um, and we were successful in engaging all 98,000 residents over the course of those five months, those five phases. That's amazing. And, and I think that behavior change piece is so critical. Uh, because if you have contamination in your cart and then we just empty it, somebody's fixing it and it just goes away. But if you have to um, get it out because your husband did it or your child did it or someone else did it, I mean, I think it really drives home that um, what goes in your cart and what doesn't. Um, we had some interesting, you know, interactions at the curb as well, where someone says, hey, 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 I got the postcard or I saw it on next door or I saw it on, you know, line. I'm going to fix it right now. So they'll service my car. And they were really like, I'll take it out right now. I'm so sorry. I didn't know plastic bags went in there. So that was really exciting um, and rewarding to see as well. So, um, you know, were there any, Moses, were there any calls from residents or um, is that overwhelming or is it manageable? H how did you all think through um, the communications, um, you know, in response from residents uh, as they were, you know, calling in or had questions? No, that's a good question. Um, so in addition to working with the Feed on the Street team um, at the onset to try to minimize those escalation situations um, from the curb. We also provided training for our customer service agents. Um, they would be the ones that ultimately received the initial call from residents. Um, agents had the ability to access images of the cart violation and any notes that accompanied them so they could confidently answer those questions. Um, most residents accepted the fact that they need to correct the issue prior to servicing, while others uh, required a little bit more convincing. Um, so for that, we developed an escalation matrix uh, for complaints that couldn't be resolved at the curbside or at the agent level. Um, so I would receive an automated notification prompting me to follow with a resident. Uh, those, conver those conversations range from your avid recycler that wanted to discuss the state of recycling ad nauseum and thank us for our efforts. Um, to the resident that simply wanted their rejected recycling cart emptied uh, without any action on their part, which we weren't having. Um, in between the two would be a senior resident that, you know, bag recyclables as a point of convenience, not understanding why all items needed to be clean, loose, and dry in the cart. Um, and then we had some extreme situations as well where we had to have some proactive targeted education, for instances where the cart was rejected due to reasons not listed on the cart tag. Um, so using your cart for yard trimming debris uh, would prompt a visit from our education and enforcement team. And we felt that those residents needed that direct education um, to curb their behavior. So that's, those are the interactions that we would most commonly see. 
that sounds like some um, some really good kind of one-on-one -on -one educational opportunities and um, and even some tertiary benefits to the program um, outside of just recycling. You know, the six contaminants, you, as you mentioned, yard waste, um, those kinds of things. Those are, that's really great. Um, okay, so we'll, uh, wrap this section up um, with a, a final question uh, to Kanika about the data component. Um, you're mentioning in the last part of your presentation that the next phase, which will be focused on participation, is going to be based on data gathered from the contamination um, focused campaign. And so can you just quickly talk through how did uh, you all get this type of data and how are you and the city using this to move forward with resident engagement and strategy in the, when the program starts back up? So uh, the app that we use um, would track um, each address and we would know if you never received a tag, um, you have a certain profile. Um, if you received a tag once or twice and you corrected it, um, you would, um, we would give you a profile. If you never participated or set your card out, we know that as well. Or maybe you just set your card out once, you know, during a four week period, we can, we consider that participation. But if you never set that out. So now we can really use those that specific those specific data points to um, drive participation. So now we know what street, what neighborhoods, what city council districts um, are participating at very high levels um, and those that are participating at low levels and, you know, use some of the tools that we know that uh, high level partic participation um, yields to help bring those up that are participating lower and just driving that home um, to them. And so we won't speak to them the same. I think the first um, campaign kind of had the same message for everybody. Um, but now we'll just specifically speak to how we know that you recycled in the fall. That's pretty innovative and exciting um, to be able to reach people where they are um, on this particular issue rather than just assuming everybody's starting from the same place. It's it's pretty powerful. Um, it is. I'm yeah. we're excited to roll this phase out. That's great. All right, so we're going to uh, transition a little bit um, and focus, um, Nicole, on on discussing Coca-Cola's role in this, the Coca-Cola Foundation's role in this project. Um, and just want to kick off by asking, why is curbside recycling important to um, the Coca-Cola Foundation or, or even more broadly, the company? Great question, Cecilia. You know, when we look at where people consume beverages, um, and especially right now in COVID times, it's almost all at the home. And so, you know, even before COVID, it's over 70%, and that's based on the research you guys have done, um, as well as our own internal research in, in terms of where people like to enjoy a beverage. So for us, we know curbside is where it's at. That's where we have the highest potential of collecting these bottles and cans. And so when you either have people, you know, wish cycling, throwing in the things that shouldn't be in there with the bottles and the cans in your Corga boxes, uh, we want to get that material out because, you know, that's just more cost for the recycler at the end of the day. Um, but then also, how do we get to Kanika's point, more participation? Now that we know, hey, this household hasn't participated in over a month, how do we get them to engage? Or how do we also get a household to recycle more? I know some of the original studies uh, the Recycling Partnership did showed that often only 50% of their cans would actually go in the recycling bin. Ha the other half go in the trash. And why would that be? So for us, you know, having this data, actually being able to see what the numbers show allows us to think through like what should we be trialing with different communities to make it better um, and i think you know atlanta is a perfect example but i'd say from a broader stance we're looking at all different you know applications where we've also worked with you on some multifamily housing recycling initiatives in different communities where those communities may not have easy access to recycling because it's not provided through the city or the county so how do we make sure that we're providing that access where all of our consumers live right and we want to make sure that that is more equalized access truly great well that leads me to my next question actually what you know what other types of projects are you involved with across the country that are sort of related to this? 
Yeah, so obviously the multifamily is a big one where we just recognize there's a gap often um, on the commercial side. And so working with uh, those multifamilies around what else could they be uh, leveraging? What are the cost benefits, right? They might actually lower their landfill costs by having a recycling program in addition. Uh, also thinking through some of the public space opportunities. Uh, so for instance, we did an initiative with the Conservation Corps out in California, um, where a lot of the beaches were lacking any recycling and infrastructure. So you might have a trash bin, but you know, you're going to go out, you're going to picnic for the day. And then at the end of that fun time, you're literally putting everything in the trash. So how do we provide the right access for those moments of enjoyment and making sure that those communities have access as well? And then we're even looking at how do we think through, um, you know, some of the broader challenges. We've seen often communication is a big piece of this. You know, a community may not even know what day their recycling pickup is. So if you've just moved into a community, how do you make sure that we're providing that feedback and the community has the tools and resources? To Kanika's prior point, you know, not every community has a huge budget to do this or a team even to resource it well. So thinking through how we can support some of those scenarios is another key focus of our, our broader efforts. That's really, really great. Um, and so my last question is, why, uh, why, why is recycling important to support in terms of your broader sustainability goals? Yeah, I mean, obviously packaging for us is a significant part of our carbon footprint. Um, and when we think about just, you know, our footprints on earth in general as individuals, we want to make sure we're, we're leaving the lightest one. And so how do we make sure that at the end of the day, someone has access to recover our beverages containers easily? Um, so this has been a critical force for us for decades. Um, and I think with our newest commitment on World Without Waste, we're just seeing how do we help change the dialogue, um, make recycling fun and exciting and, you know, not shame people when they're doing it wrong, but actually guide it. And, you know, I'd share I had so many funny encounters at work after the Feet on the Street program kicked off where a colleague would come to me and like, someone left me a tag. I was doing this wrong. I had no idea I was doing it wrong. And you start to realize like, it, it has to be personal, really. Otherwise, people don't get it. They think I'm doing it right, right? For the most part, we think we're doing these things right. So um, for us, I mean, I think making it personal and thinking through in a fun way, uh, we're going to start to see some of our, our brands take recycling message to a new uh, height, I'd say, uh, on the shelf. And so I'm excited to see some more recycling messaging coming out to inspire that recycling behavior. Um, and then I'd also recommend, I know we have a lot of communities engaged here today, you know, go to the Recycling Partnership, go to uh, the Southeast Recycling Development Council. They have grants that our foundation has wonderfully provided to help communities do the same efforts that Atlanta is doing today. And we need every community to engage so that all communities and citizens have access to recycling as well. So I'll make that final plug. <laughs> That's great. And I really appreciate you um, mentioning that because it really connects the dots for everybody watching. Um, so thank you very much. Um, OK, third section. We're talking about COVID. Um, so, uh, Kanika, how has COVID-19 impacted the city recycling and solid waste programs? And what are if you have any, what are some of the helpful hints to other cities and counties you might be watching um, that are dealing with these same issues? So uh, COVID is a very interesting and challenging time for us all. Um, we're really in this um, phase of the new normal um, and just really adjusting to that. So initially uh, in the city, it we didn't see a lot of impacts to us, quite frankly. And we were like, oh, I think we're, we may be able to weather the storm. I don't think anyone expected the storm to last for this long um, initially, but you know, we do a daily operations call and um, of how much attendance we have. And so we were at 97% attendance, 98, 99. 
in the high 90s. And then it started dropping and ticking down to the low 90s, to the low 80s, to where we are today. We're in the mid 60s. Um, and we've had to shut down um, a few of our operational facilities because of some of our staff and employees contracting COVID um, and then having to clean the facility. So that really affects your day to day operations. Um, and for us in the city, we, you know, have a pecking order of how we do our curbside collections, which includes garbage, recycling and yard trimmings. And so for us, garbage is going to be the first order recycling being the second and yard trimmings being the last. So luckily we've been able to have little impact. We've had no impact to garbage, minimal impact to recycling, but it has affected some of our, our other operations such as yard trimmings and bulk collection. Um, I know Moses may want to have something else to share and add as well. Yeah, um, Kamika's spot on um, with everyone, you know, being home with the stay at home orders, um, et cetera we had to institute uh, a campaign called If It Doesn't Fit, Schedule It, um, meaning our staff would not collect anything that's outside of your cart. So that goes for garbage and recycling. Um, so with these increase in packages at home, that means larger boxes may be curbside. Um, so it has impacted um, some collection of items outside of the cart, which in turn has increased our bulk collection demand. Um, Great news is we've seen a, a 10 a 10 percent year to day increase on our curbside recycling tonnage um, compared to FY19. So um, more bottles and cans, um, as Nicole mentioned, and you know packages, et cetera. So a lot more curbside tonnage increase. And we know this isn't you know specific to uh, the city of Atlanta. Municipal, you know all across the country, people are dealing with similar challenges. But we're here. Um, obviously, our the, the safety of our staff is of the utmost importance, um, but we're taking it day by day and making adjustments um, on the fly. And the mayor has also um, done a five phase reopening for the city, and it's based on um, data of, you know, how many cases, how many hospital beds we have available. Um, ICU beds, things of that nature are increasing in infection rates. And so, um, we had gotten into phase two and then we had some increases um, with our COVID cases and we're back in phase one. Um, so the unfortunate part of that is, is that we weren't able to roll out uh, phase two um, of the uh, Better Together campaign because we also want to make sure that not only our solid waste service crews are safe, but we also want to make sure that our, our feet on the street team is safe as well. So you all made that decision pretty early on, as I understand, uh, to, to pull the team. You, you actually started the second round of tagging with the team early March and then decided basically mid-March to, to off um, and uh, and see what happens next. Is that is that right? That's right. So um, we'll look at, uh, you know, possibly uh, uh, I think we're in COVID for longer than we probably all expected. So we may have to look at how we retool this phase two campaign and take a slightly different approach than the one that we outlined. Um, so we'll be working with TRP and Coca-Cola, of course, um, to make sure that we do what's best for all involved. And to that point, ha um, you know, have you been able to make plans for the future or, or what's kind of the signal for you all um, to be able to move forward, um, you know, with concrete dates, what, what's the signal from the city for you all to be able to move forward? So I think there's a couple of indicators uh, for us. One is where we are in um, the phases for reopening. There are five phases. Um, we are currently working from home for the most part with some outside of our field duties and city hall doesn't reopen back and that's where our offices are until phase four. But we're also looking at schools and when schools go back, because that's also a key indicator on where we are um, in terms of that. So um, Atlanta Public Schools has decided to do virtual learning um, at least until October. So that's also a good indicator for us of how we move forward as well. Great. Um, and so uh, my last question, actually, Nicole, what does the future look like or what does the future hold for Coca-Cola's sustainability goals? And we're kind of now in this conversation about how do we how do we best future? What can we plan for the future? 
Um, what does that look like? Again, what does that look like for Coca-Cola sustainability goals? I think it's a great question. You know, these are unprecedented times and we're, we're living it day in and day out with all of you. I'd say we're, we're staying home until next year. All of us are working from home until 2021. And I think we're going to see that as a trend. Uh, what we have found is an opportunity right now is actually with some of our key customers. And so recognizing that some of them might be closed, their doors are closed completely, but they have teams that want to be able to put some things in place. You know, we've actually had some partners pair up all their bins. They, they just had mainly landfill and only a couple recycling in various places. And they took this quieter time to actually refocus in all the bins. Now they're all paired. They're easily marked. So like we're seeing this is a, is a twofold, like what can we start to put legwork in now to really double down before things come back and hopefully we get back to a new normal. Um, but, you know, we're also thinking through what are the challenges that a community is going to face in three to six months from now as they try to revamp and come back and maybe the funding isn't necessarily there. Where else do we need to play a role with these communities as we're all in these challenging times? So we're looking at it from a couple different spaces and just trying to be as supportive as possible to our customers and the communities so that um, recycling doesn't stop. And I think that's the biggest piece, right? And we've seen it when, when there was toilet paper shortages, all these materials have a role in the supply chain for things that we need and love every single day. And so we want to make sure that that continues. And so however much we can facilitate that, we're, we're going to do everything we can. That is great. And that's a great place for us to, um, to wrap up here. I'll just mention lastly that for cities and towns and counties that may not have a large budget or a, you know maybe minimal staff to dedicate to contamination focused campaigns, the Recycling Partnership has resources like our DIY sign builder and um, uh, anti-contamination toolkit, which will be provided in the resources tab of this session. Um, and uh, I just want to thank uh, our, our panelists and uh, viewers for, for tuning in. Um, and uh, there will be a short survey following this session and your feedback um, as a viewer is sincerely appreciated. Also, please mark your calendar for Waste Expo 2021, which is slated for April 26th through the 29th in Las Vegas. Um, stay well and enjoy the rest of your day.